our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy? This sounds like a buzz-free zone now, Rob. Let's you hope. did well. <laughs> it last is, we're, like I said, we're troubleshooting on the fly here, baby. Also, Maria Lawrence and Maria. Good morning. And uh, hopefully you've been able to find us back again, thanks to the, uh, the Facebook uh, listening crew mod- uh, as they watch. Also, our radio audience and the TV10 audience as well. Everything should be back and up and running and restored now, and uh, hopefully without the buzz, too. And I appreciate your patience because uh, we certainly didn't make it easy for you today to stay with and follow the program. But hopefully that's all rectified now and we're back to normal for as long as normal and whatever normal is lasts. <laughs> as we welcome in now our next guest, Attorney Stephen Skinner from the Skinner Accident and Injury Lawyers. Stephen, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is mine, sir. Hey, uh, did you happen to catch the Mike Stewart interview we did yesterday? I did. I was able to take a listen to it, and um, certainly interesting. Um, you know, I'm I'm a little disappointed in um, Senator Stewart. Um, he kind of uh, made some very broad statements that um, don't really hold up. Um, I, let me, you know, he was basically criticizing J.B. McCuskey for taking money from, quote, personal injury lawyers, and he included my name. And I, let me tell you about J.B. McCuskey. Um, you know, I met his father in, I think it was 1987, and um, at, in Buchanan, West Virginia. Uh, his dad, who's a well-known Republican um, and has served – in Republican administrations in the state, well-known lawyer. Um, he and I were, it turns out, uh, we learned fraternity brothers. And uh, back then, JB was a very little boy. And I ended up not seeing JB again until 2012. Uh, well, I, December 2012, beginning of uh, January 2013, when we both arrived uh at the legislature to start serving in the House of Delegates together. And I became good friends with JV and his wife, Wendy, and we served together and we both served on the Judiciary Committee together and we became um, good friends. We worked to create legislation together and he and I had opposing views on many things. And we tried to, regardless of our views, whether there was something that I didn't like or something he didn't like, um, we tried to create better legislation together. I got to know JB as a person of complete integrity, somebody who's interested in solutions for West Virginia and puts solutions ahead of politics. And I think he's exactly the kind of person we need leading in West Virginia right now. Um, and I say that as somebody who's been an elected Democrat. Um, and I, I, I think that he would be a fantastic attorney general. So Mr. Stewart doesn't really understand um, the nature of why uh, many of the people um, would want to donate to JB. Uh, it's probably... Um, at least for me, it's because I know JB and a lot of the other folks who know him, know him as a person of integrity and vision. You know, I counter this with, you know, I, 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 I am aware that uh, Senator Stewart was spending federal money on radio ads prior to an election and got in some trouble for that when he was the U.S. attorney, something I don't think that's been addressed. You know, JB has had an absolutely flawless time as auditor of the state. When you go to the courthouses across the state, you're going to hear them talk about um, how serious JB has been about bringing transparency to spending across the state. Um, You know, you can do, you can see so many more things uh, online in terms of spending. Um, and which has gotten some folks in trouble, some government officials in trouble, but it's because JB's commitment to good government. And um, I I think it, you know, the two of them just don't even compare. 
uh, at all. J.B. McCuskey is a, a, a public leader with integrity. All right, Stephen, I appreciate your thoughts on that matter. Bill? Yeah, I did not listen to the interview yesterday, uh, uh, but I I have listened to Mike Stewart's interview in times past, uh, and I... Uh, I find it uncomfortable, and it's not new. We've had this for ever since our early history of democracy. In fact, uh, in the founding fathers had uh, strong personality differences. Uh, but I think there is a higher calling for our elected officials uh, to resort to na a name calling as their basic premise. Uh, we. The, there are issues that need to be addressed. There are platforms that need to be defined. Uh, there are uh, uh, coalitions that need to be developed. All of these are, I think, should take priority. So I, I find it a little disheartening when a politician finds their, their lead role or their lead off is critical of, um, of their opponent. And this, unfortunately, is not the first time that I've heard this from uh, Senator Stewart. Seems like whoever his opponent is, uh, he, he goes in attack mode very early. And you may have to do that to win elections. I don't know. I'm of the old school that I w wish they would be talking about platform issues. Maria? Maria? So um, are you, uh, Stephen, do you think that um, – that the fact that, um, you know, that, that JB first was going to run for governor and then changes, uh, you know, changes tracks and, and moves on to another race. And I get it. I mean, we were talking earlier about it being, um, pre candidacy. So, um, you know, folks sort of look at the landscape and, and make their decisions based on that. Do you think, first off, does anybody even remember that? I mean, I just happened to look it up and I'm like, oh yeah, he was doing that before. So, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, I'll tell you what, I urged JB probably a year ago to consider running for attorney general. And he told me he wanted to run for governor. Um, and he spent a long time figuring out, um, you know, was he going to be able to be successful? And I think that he, I think that his actions demonstrate that he thinks he's best going to be suited to win an election for attorney general. You know, I listened, uh, right before you started, you were playing a clip from Ryan Weld, who I also served with in the house of delegates. And he said he was dropping out of the attorney general's race because anybody who um, anybody who runs for statewide office, you know, is somehow isn't connecting with voters. Look, let's 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 be real here. And I, I wish Ryan had had said it, which is. If you can't if you're not going to be able to raise the money, if you're not going to be able to run a good campaign, then you probably shouldn't be running because you're going to waste a lot of time and money. And um, and that's what happened with Ryan. He was able to see that he wasn't raising the money, he didn't have the traction, and he wasn't going to be able to get anywhere. And now this comes down to a, a race between two people. And JB was running for governor, and I think that he's been pretty honest about why he's made these changes. And if it, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to speak for him, but I bet if anybody made a donation to JB uh, prior to him saying he was running for attorney general and wants their money back, I bet he'll have that money returned. I just think that, you know, for a lot of folks, um, we think that uh, as somebody who has given a lot of money to Democrats and Republicans and independents, you know, I, I'm supporting the person and, you know, I couldn't think of anybody um, who is uh, like uh, JB, who I wouldn't want to succeed in leading us in West Virginia. We have too many problems to, to focus on the hardcore political um, issues that aren't related to the policy issues. So when we hear somebody talking about the national problems and how the, there's such a problem, versus our, our real life problems in education, in healthcare, in 
um, in the environment in West Virginia. You know, when you talk to J.B. McCuskey, he talks about education. He talks about solving the actual problems that we have. And I think that is incredibly important. You know, I have over the last seven years been working on the opioid epidemic, and that in the last three years we were working in partnership with the attorney general's office, these these plaintiff lawyers across the state, and we had a we came to an agreement to focus on a common goal, which is to maximize the amount of money that we could return to the state of West Virginia and to our local governments so we could tackle the substance abuse epidemic in West Virginia. That is something that is a real world problem that the attorney general will deal with. And when you talk to J.B. McCuskey, he's engaged in the actual policy. And I think that's incredibly important. Stephen, let me go to a Pacific policy, a Pacific uh, uh, concept. Uh, Max Stewart earlier, and I guess uh, Rob mentioned uh, all fair that he may have backed off from the sum, but earlier Max Stewart had advocated that the Attorney General's office, uh, due to his responsibilities, be expanded to include a lot of what the uh, prosecuting attorney in the individual counties are doing, uh, that they felt that, the, uh, that his office could do a better job representing the individuals in the county than what the prosecuting attorney could. Uh, what is your – have you heard one – did you hear Mike Stewart make this statement, and what is your uh, impression of, of the reaction to it? Well, I, I heard a bit of it, and understand when, uh, when I speak about the issue, I speak from, uh, with my opinion, and I, I, this is in no way related to J.B.'s opinion. But, I, you know, I think that we have, uh, through the history of West Virginia – had the attorney general in a role that basically keeps them out of criminal prosecution. They assist prosecutors at times, and they also handle appellate work for prosecutors at times. But I think that our elected prosecutors, county by county, do a fantastic job. And once we start tampering with that, particularly for political ends, then, you know, we're going to create a new system in West Virginia and that we don't need when the attorney general has uh, plenty already to do on their plate, you know, from consumer protection to um, dealing with uh, uh, senior um, uh, assistance to um, also helping the state figure out our legal woes. I, I don't think that we need to expand the role of the attorney general's office in the criminal prosecution. Stephen Skinner is our guest here on the program. Uh, do either of you have a follow-up question for the line of questioning that we were dealing with here? If not, I'm going to switch gears here. No. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, if, you, if we could, I'd like to turn your attention to the West Virginia First Foundation and uh, yeah. the, the fact that uh, the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney is uh, very deeply involved in that. Uh, and uh, they appear to be getting uh, getting moving with some momentum here. I just heard a report that they uh, the money that's been sitting in the bank has already picked up one hundred and forty something thousand dollars in interest here, Stephen. Hey, I want to I want to say as we get into um, the last mile of my involvement in the opioid litigation, I could not be more excited that the Eastern Panhandle is going to have two people on this board. Um, and that's something that uh, we should all be uh, proud of and excited about. Um, Tim Saya is on the part of the board as, an, uh, as a chosen regional representative. And then Matt Harvey, Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, is, uh, is a governor-appointed member of the board and the um, chair of the board. Um, what I hope is that in every discussion that they're able to remind the rest of the board, number one, that the Eastern Panhandle exists, number two, that we are significantly impacted um, with the opioid and ongoing substance abuse epidemic, and that the spending is done accordingly. 
you know, a, a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the discussion nationally about West Virginia has been about Southern West Virginia. But when you look at the data, the Eastern Panhandle has had, you know, a, a disproportionate share of the impact in part because of our location in the interstate. And it's easy for folks with a Charleston worldview to forget that we need to be accounted for here. And I'm very um, confident that uh, Tim and Matt are going to be able to focus that attention. I'm also really excited right now that um, I was uh, just had an email yesterday that checks are going to go out for their first round of local government funding. And after all this time, I'm finally going to um, be able to say to my clients uh, here in the Eastern Panhandle, here is some money to focus on fighting uh, the epidemic here in the county for you to spend and not come through the foundation. Stephen, I want to commend you for the work that you've done on this. You've taken a major lead in trying to get monies available. but And there's a lot of money available, and it's going to fortunately be going to the counties you spelled out. But I see at least four areas uh, that could be recipient of the money. One would be the area of treatment. Another one would be uh, enforcement. A third one would be education. And the fourth one would be resources slash facilities. Uh, do these four areas, and there may be, uh, may be others as well, do, will they get equal treatment, or is it going to be focused to one particular area, such as treatment or enforcement or education? I think that one of the things, let, let's talk about the foundation first. The foundation um, was, is, was created in order to um, focus on the evidence-based solutions to the epidemic. And, and what does that mean? That's going to mean those four things that you discussed, but it's going to go beyond that. And it's also going to be about targeted spending in hot spots. So we're going to rely on the foundation to hire an executive director and to hire professionals who are going to look at evidence. The, the intention is that we don't have a repeat of how the tobacco money was spent. So, you know, today you can still hear advertising and no offense to the people who make money and, and livelihoods based on advertising, but you still hear advertising from the tobacco settlement. And too much of that money went into uh, advertising and PSAs and uh, what we didn't want was to uh, spend uh, uh, all this money just on that. So I think you're going to see some uh, cutting edge um, ideas um, actually get tested in West Virginia. And if they work, we're going to adopt them. And we're also going to do it's going to have to be different in different places. You know, we have such a different set of circumstances than Logan or Mingo or any of the, the counties in the South, that our solutions are probably going to be different. So that the foundation has a list, um, which I'm happy to share with anybody, of what its general goals are. The local money is also has what we call guardrails on how it can be spent. But when you take a look at, say, Berkeley County, they're already – spending money on the problem, money that other counties haven't been able to spend. So what this is going to be able to do, at least in part for Berkeley County, is it's going to be able to allow them to continue to do what they're doing. It's going to allow them to leverage the grants that they are already getting, but it's also going to create a little bit of relief in their budget so that they can deal with additional priorities. So, the specifics of how it's going to be spent, there, there are documents that show sort of the principles, and there are guardrails that say you can't go outside of these areas. But the, the, the major goal is evidence-based effectiveness. So, Stephen, talk a little bit about, refresh people's memories. So, 200 and 
well, currently, 217.6 million. They're thinking that number obviously is going to go up, the interest, all that. How is that parsed out county by county? How do the counties manage that money? Um, do the local folks on the foundation board have a say in that? Um, that's just a ton of money. Um, so talk a little bit about that. So let's talk generally about the overall amount of money, which is going to be somewhere in, in probably the – over a period of, of 10 years. There might be some that go beyond 10 years. A lot of this money is front-loaded. Um, let's just assume that the total amount of money is in the $850 million range, and that's for the foundation local governments – the foundation is going to get something like 74.5%, and the um, local governments are going to get about 25%, 24.5%. There's, there's, there's a couple points here and there for uh, administration of the funds. The money, the, the 75% that goes to the foundation will be completely controlled by the foundation, and that will come in over a period of time. The um, the remaining funds to the 25% that goes to local governments gets broken down and they're going to get paid over 10 to 15 years, again, with a lot of the money up front. So the, the um, uh, way the money was uh, cut up among the 55 counties and then all the municipalities was based upon a formula that we agreed to that roughly approximated the harm that was we could identify from you know, for a period of about 10 years around 20, 2012 and it's 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 a very blunt instrument for trying to figure out the harm and what we what we know and we, we, we all agreed totally in, uh, as to county by county what they would receive, with Berkeley County receiving roughly, let's say, 9% of the whole. But that um, the division between Martinsburg and Berkeley was something that we um, had to actually go into an arbitration about. But... Um, to to get resolution of of the percentages with Berkeley County getting about 75% of the money and um, the city of Martinsburg getting 25% of the money that is uh, to the county as a whole. But so there is a basis for how it was distributed and it's supposed to generally mimic the impact of the opioid epidemic. So these numbers are uh, detailed in specific tables and formulas that spent, we spent a very long time working on and then had disputes on some of the numbers that had to be mediated, negotiated, and, and in at least one or two cases, arbitrated. Um, so that, that, <laughs> that's part of the reason why this took seven years. But um, that, that's generally how it's going to go. It. So the – the county will and the city are going to receive checks, and they can spend them as they want, but subject to the guardrails that I've already talked about. Stephen, there's been much to do about the transparency. Uh, what, what, what's in place uh, to ensure transparency, and how could a local citizen access the information that uh, are they, uh, what's been done? Well, um, two things. I know that the that J.B. McCuskey is involved right now in engaging with all of the local governments about how that money is going to be spent and making sure that uh, separate accounts are set up for that money. And then we're going to be reporting. I say we, but all of the local governments are going to be reporting back as to how the money is spent. All of that, all of that information for the local government part is is going to be transparent, so that anyone who wants to look to uh, look it up, you're going to be able to see it in county budgeting documents. 
every uh, choice on how to spend the money is going to be made in an open meeting. Now, the foundation is operating in a unique place because it is um, is a 501c3 foundation that is uh, part that is effectively um, enabled through legislation passed um, this past year by the legislature. So there is going to be um, some of that spending and some of the decisions about the uh, whether they have to comply with all the open meetings that um, I, I don't know whether final determinations have been made. I suspect that they're going to uh, have to comply with Freedom of Information Act um, requests. I suspect that they're going to be fairly transparent about how the money is spent. But that's a little bit outside of, of what my job was. And, of course, my job was focusing on getting a recovery for my clients, the local governments like Jefferson, Berkeley, Morgan County. Um, that, that was what I focused on. So Steve? anybody who wants to know how that money is going to be spent can, can follow along and certainly engage with your, your county commissioners about what will happen. But, you know, give them, give them a little bit of time to collect the money before um, you start pounding down their door. <laughs> Stephen, I want to thank you very much for your time and availability this morning. Much appreciated. Always happy to come on. Good, good, good to be on with Bill and Maria. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Have a great day, sir.